Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fasila Farouk in Johannesburg. Ten months ago, South Africans watched in horror on our television screens as the police shot at striking mine workers in Marikana. As a result of the incident, 34 mine workers were killed. The miners had down tools. They were employed by the Lonman Mining Company and they were striking for better wages. The event set off uh, a strike wave in the mining industry in the Rustenburg area and as a result of the massacre at, at Marikana and a commission of inquiry has been established to look at how it, it came about that the police shot at the mine workers and with us in the studio today to talk about the commission of inquiry which is known as the Farlam Commission of Inquiry we have John Capel. John is the executive director of the Benchmarks Foundation. The important thing to note is that the Benchmark Foundation has appointed advocate George Pesos to represent the foundation at the Farlam Commission. Now the commission ostensibly is looking at the role of the police in the massacre, but the foundation is trying to broaden out the terms of reference of the commission such that it also looks at the socio-economic impact of the mining companies in the Marikana area. John, won't you tell us a little bit about the role of the foundation, uh, what you're trying to achieve through the, the commission, and a little bit more about your work in Marikana and the broader area there? Yeah. Well, the Benchmarks Foundation was established by the churches um, through two very big um, statements in 1993, or big conferences that took place, um, to look at business in a post-apartheid South Africa and to see whether business would act more responsibly, respect human rights, respect the integrity of creation, and they felt not, and they felt that a body needed to be set up to monitor the role of business in a new South Africa. Um, in, t in terms of the Marikana and, uh, and, and Farlem Commission, the Benchmarks Foundation has done extensive research over the last seven years um, in the Bunjonala district, the, um, where the big six platinum mining houses exist, Anglo Platinum in Parlour, Aquarius Royal, Buffer King Holdings, Lonman and Extrata. Um, and we examine these companies, we look at um, their sustainability reports, their annual reports, what they say about themselves, how responsible they are, what good corporate citizens they are, and how they want the world to perceive them. And we go in and we examine um, what they say about themselves against the experience on the ground, how do communities perceive these corporations, and what we find is a glaring gap between what they stated policy and their actual practices. Interestingly enough, before what's now known as the massacre in Marikana, your organization had been doing a lot of research on the ground in the communities around um, the mining companies. Um, you released a report around about the time that the massacre took place, or just before that. Can you tell us a little bit about the findings of that report? We did a study in 2006 that we released in 2007 that really showed a huge gap um, between what these companies stated about themselves, how they wished the rest of the world to see them and view them, um, and and this report said there were huge environmental problems, there were huge social problems, there were huge negative impacts on communities. So typically, when you go out and do your research in the communities, what does the community look like to you? I mean, can you describe the conditions in a community? Well, you get some established communities, but what the biggest problem you have is a lot of informal settlements, tin shacks, developments around the mining houses where migrant labour flocks to. And these these informal settlements are adjacent to the mines. And often what you have is a slime dam, um, which is very toxic um, and has a very negative impact on people's health and welfare. There's sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, in the ground. Um, there are dust problems. Is that close to where the community lives? Very close you know, um, to where these communities live. So they're picking up all these health problems. And what we already found in 2006 was that 60% uh, of people going to local clinics were reporting respiratory problems. Um, we found another problem around HIV and AIDS, that the surrounding communities, the rate is much, much higher than what the companies are reporting, and their workers live in these surrounding informal settlements. Um, and we found, for example, with Impala Platinum, that the voluntary testing 
was done from supervisory level up. So the figures are not correct. What we found is that these companies talk about investing in communities. It's very difficult to find the actual things that they say they're investing in. With Lonman, they were talking about a hydroponics project that they then selected a small group of black economic empowerment, politically connected players to, to run, and they say it's a community project, but it wasn't a community project. The whole project got corrupted and fell and fell apart. Um, so we see, ah, they say we invest in, you know, so many millions in the community, but it might be less than 1% of their profits, which is completely insignificant. They're giving very little back to these communities who have made way for mining, whose life has changed completely. Rustenburg used to be a citrus farming area. Um, people had a completely different way of life. Um, since the, well, the platinum has been around there long, but there's been a growth in the industry in the last 20 years. And mine say to communities, you're going to be better off, we're going to give you jobs. The jobs don't materialize, they make way for mining, um, the houses get cracked, the industry doesn't take any responsibility for that. They say it's inferior material. The houses are getting cracked as a result of the blasts. Of the blast, yeah, the blasting taking place. Um, then you have, you know, small things like mines use a lot of trains and there's railway crossings and children and people are getting being killed at these railway crossings. They can't even put up boom gates. The Chamber of Mines met with us in, in December and they said to us, tell us, what do you think the industry should be doing in the short, medium and long term? Um, so we gave them um, a, do a document and we spelt out what we thought, thought the short term things that could be doing, the medium term things that could be doing, and the long term things that could be doing. Um, and so we're waiting to see if there will be any results from that. Um, we engage with these mining companies as well and we talk to them. And we're going to be talking to Lundman. And if we just focus on Lundman for a bit, we presently are doing a study on their sustainability reports um, that go out to the world and, this, and the way they want to portray themselves. And what we find is that, um, is that these reports continually are confessions and they're saying, well, you know, um, we, we, we want to do zero harm on the community, but, you know, um, we've, had, um, we've had sulfur dioxide leakages into this water system, into that river there, etc. Um, but we're going to improve upon it, don't worry. And then you, you look the next year and you see, well, you know, are, have they improved upon that? And are they within the ambit of the law? And then we find that um, they continue exceeding their emissions. So there's this whole toxic mix um, and communities are completely ignored. Their health and welfare is ignored. Government does not play its regulatory and oversight role. The green scorpions don't do their job. Um, and so we're making recommendations to the Human Rights Commission to investigate this in a deeper way. We've spoken to the, um, the Mineral Petroleums and um, Resource Development Act Portfolio Committee dealing with amendments to, to that act. We're trying to get that portfolio committee to go down to Rustenburg. We will give them what we call toxic tours of the area. We'll show them what's going on so they can experience it firsthand. And I think if one starts to understand this from a first-hand experience, then you will know why. Um, the strike at London took place. You will know why communities every now and again are bringing the mining houses to a standstill and stopping the operations for two or three days just to get the mining company to talk to them. This has been building up over the years uh, in general um, and I mean of course the situation is just made worse by the low level of wages that people are earning. Yet after the incident at Marikana and what with the establishment of the Commission now, attention has really been focused away uh, from all of these issues. Um, of course, you know, it, public outrage is really focused on the police and, and justifiably so. But tell me a little bit more about what's happening on the ground now post Marikana, 10 months later. What are the prospects for people's living conditions to be improved? What are the prospects for wages to be improved for people working in, 
in the mining industry in that particular area and in the country in general? I think one, that the weakness of the Farlin Commission is that it's not going to fully address the root causes of what gave rise to the strike at London. Now we must remember that Impala Platinum has faced the same problems, the Anglo Platinum the year before that faced the same problems, that Aquarius have faced the same problems, that it's a big problem within the industry, that there's a lot of discontent among workers on the one hand, around their living conditions and their wages, and they don't feel that they are being fairly compensated for the minerals that they are producing. We know that these companies have made super profits um, up until 2009, 2010, and they, con and they continue to be profitable. Um, and at the moment, yes, the Farland Commission is fo focusing on the shoot killings, but I think we need to look behind that and say what gave rise to that. So we see that there's an agenda around corporate social responsibility, CSR. And um, two years ago when we hosted our annual general meeting, we had a theme called CSR The Truth. What is actually going on? Um, and what we found is that, is that these corporations use CSR as a public image building exercise, um, as a marketing strategy. And that most of the reports are drawn up by their public relations arm, you know, and is to convey a picture and a perception of themselves to the wider world that they are really good companies. But in reality, they're facing huge resistance from their own workers and they're facing huge resistance from the surrounding communities that are impacted upon. At the moment in Rustenburg, 15 communities have joined together um, and uh, under, under an umbrella body called Boer, um, which is voice, to give voice to the communities. Um, and they've made submissions to the Farland Commission as well. And they are saying that the Farland Commission has to address the broader socio-economic conditions of, 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 of communities and of workers. So, John, as a result of the strike wave in Marikana, um, mining company Amplatz a couple of months ago announced that they were going to retrench 14,000 workers. They haven't quite gone through with it yet. Um, but this week, for example, we've read in the press that they've made some kind of compromise with government around the numbers of people they're going to retrench. 7,000, they're saying now, half the number that they originally intended to retrench. Um, your views and comment on that? Earlier on this year, we wrote an article around that. Um, and we felt that, wow, you know, this is a retaliatory action on the one hand towards the rising discontent by workers and the militancy of workers on the platinum belt. Um, and we felt listening to Harmony Gold on this issue and the way they shut down their operations and wouldn't allow workers back to work and the CEO of Harmony Gold saying, well, we are seizing the agenda back. Uh, we're taking control. We're really going to sort of teach workers a lesson was the message. Then the next moment there's the anglo Pat announcement they're going to retrench 14,000 workers. Why at this time are they going to retrench 14,000 workers when there's growing discontent and growing worker militancy? One, as you know that there's a bit of a slump in the global demand for platinum. So it's an ideal time for the company to take a kind of retaliatory action uh, against workers, but at the same time they're saying, ah, shops, you know, we want a benchmark of a profit ratio of 14% per shaft. Now we've looked at this and we've seen that those shafts that they want to close down where those workers are affected are operating at 8% profit rate. So they're not unprofitable. They're profitable. That's a benchmark in agriculture in other sectors of the economy. But there's so much pressure to increase profit at any cost. You know? So one has to ask, what, are the, what is the political you know, dimensions informing this? Um, is it purely just a, you know, an economic issue for the company? On the one hand, it's a way to increase profits, but it's also a way to deal with the rising militancy of, of workers on the platinum belt. And workers are, of course, most threatened when their jobs are at stake. Um, so I think that's one big problem. I think the second biggest problem is all these companies have politically connected people sitting on their boards. Valley Musa is the chairperson of Anglo Platinum. Um, Cheryl Corrales has just become the chairperson of Goldfields. Um, then you have Sora Ramaphosa sitting on the board of Lundman. This is an industry where black economic empowerment is taking place, where there are a few individuals 
um, gaining billions at the expense of communities. These companies feel if they have got politically connected people sitting on their boards, they can ride roughshod over communities and workers. And I think this also needs to be looked at in, 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 in a deeper way, and we need to understand the political agenda around mining. At the end of the day, what are you hoping will come out of the Farnham Commission? I hope that the Farnham Commission will address the role of corporations within this and look at, at, at the practices of these corporations and how they externalise their costs um, and develop a deeper understanding of, of the underlying root causes um, that gave rise to what happened in Marikana. We hope that the Farland Commission will listen to a number of recommendations that the Benchmarks Foundation has made in its Policy Gap 6 report communities in the platinum mine fields. Um, and I think we make a number of recommendations to these corporations, specific, we have specific ones to all the corporations and general ones to all of them. We have recommendations to government, to local government, provincial government, to the Human Rights Commission, to the regulatory bodies, to the Green Scorpions, uh, to the Department of Environmental Affairs and the Department of Mineral Resources. And we hope that these recommendations are addressed. We're repeating them. Um, we've raised them before in our studies. Um, and we will continue to monitor these corporations at a grassroots level through our community monitoring school that surrounds all these companies' operations. Um, and we will definitely continue to publicise the truth as to what is going on within the industry um, and we hope that that kind of advocacy work will start to bear pressure on these corporations and they will start to um, spend money where they need to and stop externalising the costs um, and making their profits in a sense in a very unethical manner. John Cape, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service.